To briefly summarize what we have covered so far, we have been discussing the essential Yoga Sutras, not the entire Yoga Sutras, but only those Yoga Sutras that are really essential for sincere seekers. This is not an intellectual approach or scholarly approach to the Yoga Sutras. We do not intend to learn them by heart, like some people do. We don't need to analyze every Sanskrit word and the root where the word comes from. We just want to get the gist of it and get to know those absolutely essential Yoga Sutras that will help us on our inner journey. The Yoga Sutras start with the high-level overview. It explains what is yoga. Having explained that state is yoga when pure consciousness shines forth and you rest in that, you know that you are one with the infinite whole. You are a wave of bliss and beauty in this vast ocean of consciousness. How do you get there? It immediately goes into it, dives in immediately very deep. How do you get there? By uncoloring your thoughts. So, if you have to uncolor your thoughts, you first need to know what kind of thoughts you have. The Yoga Sutras explain that there are two basic kind of thoughts, klishta and eklishta. Those that are colored, which lead us to a false belief that worldly objects give us everlasting pleasure, and those that are not colored. And these promote the direct experience of our true nature. The Yoga Sutras also go a little bit into the analysis of the mind, studying the mind, since we want to calm the mind to, to get to know our true nature, we need to understand the mind as well. We understand the different kinds of thoughts, five main kind of vrittis, and how to be calm the mind through practice and non-attachment. Yoga Sutras explain these, what is practice and what is non-attachment. It also explains that there are three kinds of students. Those who are mild, those medium intensity, and those with a high degree of intensity and enthusiasm. Similarly, there are three kinds of techniques and philosophies. The entire system can be slow, medium, or fast. And depending on your nature as well as the system you are following, you could be fast or medium or slow. The Yoga Sutras also cover the obstacles that would meet us in this path and provides one solution for that, for all the obstacles, is to continue on the path, to continue training your mind and to not to stop practicing, to just continue uninterrupted practice over a long period of time. It explains how we can approach the external world, provides us with some guidelines so that we are not making our external world more difficult and complicated for ourselves. And it explains five methods that we could possibly use to calm ourselves down, calm the mind down. It talks about Kriya Yoga and the five forms of coloring, five kinds of coloring, the kleshas. These are important. And the kleshas may be active, interrupted, attenuated or latent. It says that we deal 
with the deeper coloring really at the final stage and that the milder coloring is dealt through meditation. We come finally to Yoga Sutras 12 to 25 and these now go into the detail of how we break the alliance between karma and kleshas. It's the kleshas, this colored kleshas and thoughts that are leading to more karma. More karma leads to the strengthening of kleshas. And that vicious cycle, it continues. It gets stronger and stronger. How do we break this alliance between these two? So the Yoga Sutras 12 to 25 explain the core, the cornerstone of meditation. And it is not possible to really meditate or to begin meditation without understanding how karma and samskaras are related and how they form a vicious circle. I am well aware that there are many people who practice something. They are practices, they are exercises, they are techniques. They practice these techniques, they call this meditation. The Yoga Sutra does not call it meditation. In the Yoga Sutra, there are technical words and these words are defined very clearly. Those techniques may be useful for health, they may be useful at whatever level, but they may not necessarily be dhyana. Dhyana or meditation is the seventh step of Ashtanga. So, whatever these people are doing, they may not necessarily be doing meditation. In order to reach the stage of dhyana, it is important to understand how karma and samskaras are related and how that cycle keeps on. It's an infinite cycle and gets stronger and deeper and more intense. Karma is simply action. Simply put, it's nothing other than any action that you undertake. This word has become very esoteric. It's used now in English language. And it can mean many different things for different people coming from different cultures. Here, we understand it purely from a technical perspective. And that is, karma is action. And samskara are the impressions that these actions create in our mind. So, it's a thought, it's an image, it's a feeling. All these are impressions that are created in your mind. But karma is the action itself. What happens to you is not karma. It is what you do that is karma. So if you are in a situation and you act in a certain way, your action is called karma. But, but the surroundings and what caused you to do that action, that is not called karma. That is simply nature or events that happen around you. It's your response or your reaction that's karma. And there are three kinds of samskaras that are created out of these, sorry, four kind. But the fourth is, we will go into the details of the fourth, but basically three kinds of colored samskaras or kleshas that are formed by any action. If your action is virtuous, pure motivated, purely motivated, good action, good deed, you help an old lady cross the road. You have no ulterior motives, no intentions. You are not expecting any rewards. 
You just do it because you want to help. That is white karma. Glaciers that come from evil action. That's black karma. Now the same old lady who's trying to cross the road, instead of helping her, you deliberately push her. <laughs> That's evil, right? <clears throat> That's exactly why it's called black karma. What about black and white karma? We call it black and white or mixed. Let's say you help this old lady because you're expecting a little reward from her. Or you expect thank you, compliments, oh, what a wonderful person you are. It was not a pure action. It was not an evil action, it was not black, but it is not white either. It's mixed. So we can imagine very clearly that most of the action we do is mixed. Most of the time we are not doing action selflessly. Even if it is good action, it's not selfless. Here, black karma doesn't necessarily always have to be something as evil as pushing an old lady <laughs> in front of a car or something. But you may have deliberately manipulate people, for example. You may talk badly about somebody, gossip. You know, these things most of us are doing unconsciously. If somebody would confront you with this, you would be shocked and say, I didn't intend to do any evil. But <clears throat> at an unconscious level, there was a thought. So that would be also black karma. You intended to deceive somebody or hurt somebody you know, sometimes you just, without thinking, you say sometimes something rude or nasty. This is also black karma. It's not evil, but it's black. Which is why virtuous, evil, these kind of words are very judgmental. Black and white, on the other hand, we can categorize without really judging too much. So I like that. I, I find that a very useful way of classifying karma. Then comes the fourth, the fourth kind. This is a very, very special kind. And this, if you understand this, and if you are able to get this, then you have understood the absolute core of meditation. If you can understand this, that would be a very, very great step. And this is known as not black, not white. And that happens only in deep meditation. When you are witnessing. Any questions so far? Okay, good. In that case, we'll continue. All the colored glaciers form impressions and these impressions, as you know, are called samskaras. These lead to another life. 
These either lead to further action in this life itself or to another life. So as long as the samskaras remain, the coloring remains at the very root of the samskaras, that cycle of birth, rebirth will continue. And it has three results. It results in birth, it results in a lifespan, and it results in experiences that one goes through. Janma, Ayush, and Bhog, these are the three results. The birth you have is determined by the kind of samskaras you have. If you have predominantly good samskaras, you will get a, a, a high birth. An evolved soul will get a good body. If you have predominantly black samskaras, you could have an animal body, for example, or a poor birth, you know, in a in an environment which is not going to allow you to evolve and unfold. The length of your lifespan is also determined by your samskaras. A long, short lifespan depends on the nature of your samskaras. And the experiences that you go through also depend on your samskaras. Over here, of course, there is a need for some faith. It's difficult to explain how the length of your lifespan can be determined by your samskaras or experiences life, how they are determined by a past life. This, of course, requires some experience through meditation. Suffice to say that length of lifespan is something that we can also influence through our karma or our samskaras in this lifetime. We all know that when you're born in a certain family, you may have genetic factors that you cannot change. But modern science tells us that these factors, the genetic factors, account for only one-third. Two-thirds depends on the environment and lifestyle. So through your active action and your conscious approach to your life, you can extend your lifetime by leading a healthy life, exercise, a good diet. All these things make a difference. A simple thing like a stressless life or a life where you don't have too much stress also can dramatically extend your lifespan. A simple example, all of you may have seen dogs breathing. Dogs pant very fast, you know, when they have, especially when they run a little bit and they pant, they breathe in and out very fast. And we all know that dogs have a very short lifespan, 10 to 15 years. Elephants, on the other hand, have a much longer lifespan. And when you study the elephant, it breathes much slower. If you see a tortoise, a tortoise is one of the longest living animals, lives up to 300 years, and we see that they breathe very slowly. So we connect the breath, the mind, and the lifespan in this manner. If you are calm and relaxed, your breath will be slow. If your breath is slow, you live longer. So the Pranavadans say, your lifespan is not measured in years. Your lifespan is measured in the number of breaths 
you take. You have a predetermined amount of breaths that you have been given through your samskaras. It has been determined. And if you use up these breaths very fast through fast breathing, heavy breathing, then you shorten your lifespan. And if you breathe slowly, deep breath, you live longer. So this is the more practical aspect that I'm referring to here. This is part of the, the science of pranayama. A person who is very sharp, has a very sharp sense of discrimination, which is called buddhi, very sharp buddhi, such a person recognizes that all worldly objects cause misery and suffering. And that the only pain and suffering that we can avoid is the one to come. So we are not, this is not a fatalistic text. You can change the things in the future. You can change your life. You can take your life in your own hands. You don't have to wait for destiny to play itself out. And we can change it by breaking this alliance of karma and samskaras. So the root cause of suffering is this alliance. And what alliance? Also the alliance of pure consciousness, which is Atman, to Buddhi. Now, this may come as a surprise to many, because we have always said Buddhi is, in inverted commas, Buddhi is good. Buddhi is your sense of discrimination, buddhi is, you need to sharpen your buddhi. And now it says that the cause of suffering is that buddhi has got, has an alliance with pure consciousness or atman. And we are beginning to mistake buddhi for pure consciousness. Buddhi is not pure consciousness. Buddhi is part of the mind. It's, closest to pure consciousness. It's very much like pure consciousness in its quality, in its nature, but it's not the same. All objects have three qualities. Sattva, Rajasa, Tamas. Yoga Sutra also uses words like Prakash, Kriya and Stiti. A more familiar language or technical words are Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. All things have this nature, tamas, rajas and sattva, including buddhi, because buddhi, we said, is a part of the mind. If your buddhi is very tamasic, it's very dull, then you will suffer more. And if it is sattvic, you will not suffer. You see through things, right? You cut through things. So it's the mind around which clouds the buddhi and buddhi is not able to see. So a tamasic buddhi is one that is in a very cloudy mind and cannot really see through things. It's too much coloring, there are too many kleshas. These qualities also exist in the senses, active and cognitive senses. This is these active and cognitive senses as well as the inner organ of the mind known as antakarna also have these qualities. Antakarna, the inner mind, the instrument is very useful for experiencing the world. You experience the world in the form of pain and suffering. But it's also very useful for attaining liberation. The 
How is that possible that it can do both? It's an instrument, just like a knife in the hand of a surgeon can save a life. But the knife, the same knife in the hands of a murderer can destroy a life. The instrument, it's merely an instrument. It's neither good nor bad. Similarly, the Andhakarna, which is made up of Buddhi, Manas, Chitta and Ahankara, is the only instrument you have. You have no other instrument. And so, Bhagavad Gita says, either your mind is your friend or your foe. What would you rather have it be? Cultivate a friendship with the mind. The yoga, the yoga Vashishta gives a beautiful example. How do you take a thorn out of your foot? If you're walking and you get hurt and there's a thorn stuck in your foot, you use another thorn to take out that thorn. Similarly, you must use the mind to master the mind. So because the mind has these qualities of sattva, rajas and tamas and most people have a lot of tamas, there are a lot of kleshas and because there are a lot of kleshas they are not able to see through they think that buddhi is pure consciousness. If they get a glimpse of this buddhi they think oh this is pure consciousness but in fact it's not. It's close in nature to pure consciousness, but it serves pure consciousness. Pure consciousness itself does not serve any purpose. It is the end in itself. It simply is. While buddhi is there to serve pure consciousness. So the nature and the essence of all the objects in the world, including buddhi, are to serve as objects for the individual consciousness. And when you have fulfilled the purpose of attaining liberation, it just disappears for such a liberation. As a, as a liberated individual consciousness. It's no longer, in, it, it loses its individuality. Buddhi, however, remains the appearance of the world continues because all the other individual selves have not recognized the character of Buddhi. They have not recognized that Buddhi and pure consciousness are different. So this is avidya. Avidya is mistaking buddhi for pure consciousness. And breaking this alliance between buddhi and pure consciousness leads to the natural state of liberation. Any questions? Any comments there? Radhika Ji? Yes. How did this alliance come into being? <laughs> <laughs> well, traditionally one said, are you interested in counting the mangoes or are you interested in enjoying the mangoes? 
The Rig Veda says no one knows the answer. To that question that you have just asked, no one knows. It actually says no one knows. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter, Thank you. they say. It doesn't matter anymore, they say, how it came to being. The fact that this alliance has come into being and now you have to deal with it. That's what it says. <laughs> of course, I'm putting it in a, a very simple, straightforward English. And um, the scriptures say it in very nice, um, beautiful Sanskrit. <laughs> but, but it's exactly what I said. They say, no one knows and now get on with it. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> they say it very nicely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. This is a, a very important group of um, sutras here the verses 12 to 25 and they are very intense they're very deep and of course we've gone through all these in just half an hour so it seems like a lot and it is a lot you you must imagine that these were explained and are still explained to students of meditation, those who are practicing systematically under guidance. And as I gave you the example of white karma, woman, you know, old lady crossing the road and, and you help her, these kind of examples you begin to see in your life. You begin to become more conscious of your own thoughts and you start analyzing them as white, black and mixed. When you have a few glimpses in your meditation of a higher state of consciousness where maybe just for a few moments you are able to witness, you will recognize that moment as not white, not black. When you begin to get these kind of little glimpses and experiences, you begin to see the connection between your thoughts, your breath, and the world around you. You begin to see that the world is your reflection. You know, it's just like when you go look at your mirror and you see yourself in it. You know very well that looks like you, but that is not you. It's a reflection. Now imagine you look into the mirror. You don't see yourself, but you see the world. And that's exactly how it is around you. This world is your reflection. It's reflecting what is in your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your, your impressions. And the more glaciers that surface and through the power of meditation, you're able to uncolor these, the more you will begin to see through this tamas, which is the tamas of the mind, the cloudy mind. And the sharper your buddhi becomes, there's more sattvic the buddhi is able to see through and you suddenly realize one day, oh, my buddhi is not myself. They are two different things. It's a great day. When that happens, it's a great moment. It's an amazing discovery. It's an earth-shaking discovery. In that moment, you begin to understand that the pure, your pure nature, your, your natural state is that of pure consciousness. 
and that pure consciousness does not serve any purpose. It is an end in itself. It's a delight. It's a play. It is reasonless joy. Okay. If there are no further questions about that section on glaciers and how to keep the alliance, then we continue. As long as you remember that this is a very, very important section. So, what happens when you have discovered one fine day, quite suddenly, a very, very special day, that, in fact, buddhi and pure consciousness are different? This leads to liberation. If it's just a glimpse, you're beginning the process, real process of, of, of liberation. And you get seven kinds of insights. You can see these seven insights as a kind of stages in your evolution. When you have this, one of the first insights you get is the practitioner knows all the things he must give up. Renounce. He realizes that there are so many things he does not need in his life or her life. It's, it's a very important first insight. Our lives are very cluttered with lots of objects, lots of activities, lots of thoughts. And we do need to, once in a while, do some sort of cleaning up or, or um, tidying up our lives, bringing a little bit of order into our lives. And this is one of the first insights that such a person would have. He, begin, he knows, he knows that this is not useful. For example, there are a lot of people who pursue careers and fame and money and uh, to a very deep extent. I mean, we do need money and we need to live in this world and, and we need our jobs, etc. I'm referring to those who may be so deeply in the glaciers that they may not realize really why they're doing it. They've just been programmed. Such a person would then suddenly realize, oh, I don't need this. I don't need this to make me feel better or good about myself. I already am. The second insight he would have, the practitioner knows the coloring that is the cause of attachment to these things. The strength of this coloring has been reduced until it can no longer be reduced. So first he realized, okay, I have a coloring. I'm very ambitious. I want to be famous or I want to have a, a great job and a career. I want a title. All these things. So first he knows, I, have, I need to get rid of this. Getting rid of it or giving it up doesn't mean that he actually physically has to give it up. It means that he has to give up the attachment to it. He doesn't have to give up the object, remember that. But he has to give up the attachment to the object. So... He begins to notice his coloring. His coloring begins to, to lose its power over him. 
and it reduces until it can no longer be reduced. When this has happened, a big, big step has been taken forward because now he knows how to reduce the coloring. And if he can do it one time, he can do it more often. He can do it with all the coloring which is in his mind. He can do it with all the samskaras. And therefore, the third insight is, liberation is now only a matter of practice and realization. It's to practice and realize that he is pure consciousness. As he keeps doing this, he begins to also realize that a sharp buddhi is a means, is a tool. He realizes its importance. Among a lot of practitioners who come to yoga, to come to meditation in the early years, they always tend to condemn the mind. There's always this tendency to say, oh, my mind is a monkey mind. It's always jumping from here to there. And they condemn the mind. Oh, these horrible thoughts and oh, such a bad person. I should not be like this. And there's a lot of self-condemnation. I'm not good at this. Um, I'm, I'm, this is not working, I'm not able to do this, this kind of negative thinking. And you begin to realize that this is not useful because you only have one mind. Remember what Bhagavad Gita said? Bhagavad Gita said, the mind is either your best friend or your worst enemy. And you don't want to make an enemy of the mind. So stop condemning your mind. Instead, train your mind and cultivate a friendship with it. So these four insights liberate one from rituals, from external practice and the binding power of karma. It's a very important to know that when you've had these kind of insights which are related to your own samskaras, you will completely, completely lose interest in rituals, in any kind of external form of practice. When I mean external form of practice, I don't mean asanas. Asanas are part of that uh, process of going inwards. And then... I don't mean asanas as a form of exercise or the way they're practiced in schools of physical culture, but I mean asanas for the purpose of yoga meditation. So I'm not referring to external practices as in asanas, but external practices where you you would the mind is basically outward oriented like in rituals and as long as you're performing these rituals and external practices you have not begun to liberate yourself from the binding power of karma The fifth insight, as we continue, the fifth insight is that buddhi serves individual consciousness. Then suddenly there is this grand insight, oh, buddhi really does serve in individual consciousness. It's not the master, it is in fact the servant. It serves individual consciousness. And when this happens, there begins an irreversible process of dissolving back into the source of all things. 
must remember it's an irreversible process when this happens when this alliance between buddhi and pure consciousness has been broken it is the beginning of an irreversible process if you do not allow that process to unfold if you block that process create obstacles you will be stuck and that stuckness there is uh, experienced as a great deal of suffering so the process must be allowed to unfold you cannot stop that anymore and when that happens finally individual consciousness shines forth and it is self luminous like the sun are there any questions with regard to the seven insights if any of you is studying if anybody here is studying the yoga sutras from some of the more uh, academic books that are available you will find sometimes the language is very difficult to follow and here it may seem very simple but it's not simplistic it's simply put it's in an easy language to understand but it is very deep and it's very profound when you will read scholarly books the problem is that you don't even understand what they're writing it becomes so complicated that that you miss the thread and it's the thread that runs through these these 196 sutras that's the most important part that's why it's called sutras sutra means thread that runs through all the 196 and that's why before every session i recap so that we don't lose that thread we don't lose the overview uh hello yes yeah radhika ji yeah i want to ask uh, one question mm -hmm. mm. yeah in this seven points like uh, number 1 and 2 uh, the practitioner knows all things that he must give up yeah but uh, second point like uh, you know this uh, like this comes after like uh, when when like uh, after deep meditation when one has uh, got glimpses and like um, then only like uh, when he has already like you know difference between buddhi and consciousness only after this they like uh, the practitioner knows these things or like uh, even like when one has not got glimpses and uh, you know like they understand these things uh, did you understand my question yeah 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 <laughs> yes i <laughs> <you> did <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> what is you know like i want to clarify it <laughs> yes uh, you you said um, is it only after uh, deep meditation um yeah, a glimpse or just doesn't have sometimes, to sometimes you know one just knows yes yes a, a glimpse does not have to happen after a long deep meditation a glimpse is called fleeting samadhi or they also known as shan samadhi shan means a moment momentary samadhi you know they happen it, it fleeting it just happens for for a second or so in that moment 
somehow you begin to see something. Just for a moment, you might even ask yourself, while you're just walking down the street, crossing the road, and suddenly the whole world appears different. I think that many of us have gone through that experience. It's just that most people forget about it. Very few people hold on to that moment and say, hmm, what happened there? What, what just happened to me? I was there and now I'm, I'm different again. Somehow I was clear and next minute it's all cloudy again. So these moments of clarity which come and go, these moments also bring certain realizations. And so when that moment, these momentary realizations happen often enough or they, are, they become more intense, they become longer and that can happen, then these insights become clear. So yes, it can happen in deeper meditation, as in you're really sitting there and trying to meditate or do something <laughs> which you've been told to do, or it comes as grace, kripa, guru kripa or just kripa, and through past karmas in another life perhaps that are unfolding. And when that happens, you have that insight which tells you, okay, I need to change my life, I need to do something here. And it all depends on the intensity of those moments, of these insights. When they are very strong in intensity, we say we have an adhikari now. The person is, is you know the Yoga Sutra said there was a student who is mild, medium or high intensity. So if the intensity is very high of that experience, that, that glimpse, then you become an adhikari. You, you become a student of the highest quality. If the experience was very mild or maybe you don't have any experience at all. You are doing meditation or practice because somebody is telling you to do it. Somebody said it's good for you. Your parents say it's good for you. Your teachers say it's good for you. Or your friends said, I'm doing it. Do you want to do it? It's good for you. So some people do it because somebody said it's good for you. Now, if that happens, this person is a very mild student. It's not a student of high intensity. He's not an adhikari. So these insights may not come to that person. And it may take a long practice. It may not even happen in this lifetime. But if he has had these insights, these glimpses, whether naturally or through meditation, then he knows what to give up, how to give up. And he is able to reduce Okay, the thank you. Yeah. Okay, so these are the seven insights. Through the practice of the different limbs, this coloring is washed away and sense of discrimination is sharpened. So, when somebody has had a glimpse on the inside and he's got this insight here that, that, that I must give up things, I want to reduce the coloring, what should he do? The third insight said, liberation is a matter of practice. Practice what? So, we come to the answer. You practice this, a systematic practice. These are the limbs. Now, because it is written, and due to the limitations of the text here, it is written in a linear manner, one after the other, which leads many people to the belief that first I have to practice yamas, which is observances, then I have to do some commitments, make commitments, niyamas. Then I have to practice asanas. After that only I can do pranayam. 
and then there are something like pratyahar dharana dhyan samadhi which nobody seems to know anything about and so what do you have you have yoga schools and meditation centers all over the world where they are telling you about yamas and niyamas and they give you asanas and some breathing exercises to do these are the outer limbs and the inner limbs pratyaha dharana dhyan samadhi people have intellectual discussions about these what people forget is that these are ashtanga eight limbs not eight steps steps is something that is linear you go one step by another so you begin at the bottom and then you go slowly up however they didn't say eight steps of yoga or they didn't call it the yoga ladder or something like that they called it ashtang imagine the human body we need all our limbs that's what a healthy body is about imagine you don't have one of your limbs or oh, that would be terrible right you would you would be handicapped a little child a baby you know when they start crawling and then slowly they they, they need to stand up and then walk for that they need all their limbs the entire body functions as a whole it doesn't function in parts and this is a very important insight if you have this insight you will understand that we need to do all of these we can't say okay let me just do this first let me observe let me be honest and these are the yamas let me be no i will practice ahimsa i'll practice satya i'm going to practice brahmacharya all these things i'm going to make some commitments now some swachha you know cleanliness be be calm all these things i'll do a few asanas and then maybe a little bit of breathing but we also need to begin to practice pratyahar pratyahar is training and directing the senses inward if you look search in the internet for pratyahar you will find practically nothing whatever you find they will say pratyahar is directing the senses inwards and that's about it nobody explains to you how to do it dharna nobody knows what dharna is dhyana has been turned into meditation good translation but the word meditation itself has been completely misunderstood so people say oh i'm meditating on my uh, you know my future i don't know i'm reflecting i've got to think of something that's not meditation that's thinking but we use the word meditation in this manner reflection contemplation are different from meditation as defined by the yoga sutra yoga sutra dhyana means letting the awareness flow towards that particular object continuously it's a flow with dharana you are attempting to focus the mind is not able to stay with that object for a long time you're training it with dhyana the effort has been dropped you don't need effort anymore it has become effortless and the mind can stay with that object for a longer period of time without effort and samadhi is then the direct experience of the difference between pure consciousness and the rest of the universe which means now you know and have realized that pure consciousness buddhi and all the gunas are different from pure consciousness so one of the main insights i would like you to take home or or to take with you and keep with you and to let it grow on you is that 
ashta ang are the limbs it has to be seen as a whole and not as steps and that we need to learn to do all eight we need to learn all eight of them we cannot just do parts your body has all four limbs it doesn't have only one limb or two limbs it has all four limbs so similarly we need in our stung we need all the eight limbs any questions about this about the eight limbs of yoga In that case, we end our session today. We continue next time with the verses thirty to thirty-four, which explain in further detail yamas and niyamas, and the siddhis as well. And um, yes, that's uh, that's very interesting stuff and very useful. So have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye bye.